Hi, I'm Wendell Steinhauer, president of the New Jersey Education Association. NJEA is committed to celebrating excellence in education. That's why we're proud to support Teacher Appreciation Week, a special series produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating New Jersey's talented and dedicated teachers. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Montclair State University, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Verizon, and by the North Ward Center. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. And by New Jersey Family Magazine and njfamily.com. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You've you got this? There it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. We are pleased to uh, be joined by Jesse Ryan, music teacher, Dwight D. Eisenhower Middle School in beautiful Freehold, New Jersey. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's music good to, teacher. Good to be here. You're a music teacher. I am. When did you know that music was your love and teaching was your love? Um, it kind of crept, kind of crept up on me. Honestly, I, it, I just kind of stumbled upon it. I didn't really have anyone in the family that was musical. I just had a piano in the basement, and you I played just, it. Yeah, I, I didn't know anything about it. I just made noise on it for a while, and. Uh, Little by little, you know, it became more a part of my life. So I started writing music and jamming with friends. And, you know, in high school, my father passed, and I used it as a, a way to get through that a little bit. And I really started writing a lot. Mm. And then I realized, you know, this is something that I want to do. So I ended up going to college for music. Not to be a teacher. Not to be. N well, I did not want to be a teacher, but I, that wasn't, I went to music school because that was my passion at the time. I felt like this is what I want to do. And uh, so I went to Berkeley and surrounded myself with a bunch of people that helped me grow. And, you know, I, I, ended, I ended up signing up for a mentor program. And I we was working with kids in Boston. And I really enjoyed it. Still wasn't, like, my goal. My, my parents were teachers, too, though. So maybe that was in the back of my mind. Uh, something happened because you're connecting now. And as part of our classroom, well, as part of the partnership with the New Jersey Education Association, this is part of our classroom close-up collaboration, a great series that the NJEA has with our partners at NJTV. This is a feature on you and your work at uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower Middle School in Freehold, New Jersey. This is uh, Jesse Ryan, Music Education. <laughs> Let's just play the whole song, end it however you think you're supposed to, and then we'll correct it after that, okay? Jesse Ryan's love of music is two, undeniable. One, two, three. See. My whole mission as a music teacher is to make kids love music in any way possible. Stop. Maddie. You're gonna just hunt. Before Jesse became a teacher, he played in a rock band that toured the U.S. and Japan. You jog, don't sprint. Just jog. But this school of rock type program he created has become his passion. This year, the name of the band is called Static. That's the eighth grade performance class. We're putting on a concert tonight, and it's a year-long class and we, we work on all aspects of performing, arranging, and we, we work on arranging the set too, like how to put on a show, how to take the audience on a roller coaster ride. I'm not one to say, oh, I'm so proud of this because this is so great, but I usually feel that inside, like that this is something special. Like these kids are, these kids are, look professional. Know, they, they get this confidence to, as they go. And I think that's what it's about, is them realizing, you know what? We didn't think we could do it, and we did it. You can't be just sitting like this. You have to be- Mr. Ryan is a great leader. He really wants to help guide us, because he knows that 
uh, we would kind of struggle on our own, I guess. Yes! But your shoulders are still turned to this way. I critique that's, him and I critique him and I critique him. I, I try to love him up, but I'm, I'm pretty tough on him. I push him. Keyboard! Some of them, I think they discover, oh, I, I can play keyboard. Or, you know what? I could be in a band if I want to. You know, some of them are already there and they discover I can lead a band. I don't care if it hurts. You have to have ideas. It doesn't even matter necessarily if you're a good player. You have to, like, be creative. You have to contribute. Sometimes I let go of the wheel. There's times where it's like, we're not getting anywhere. Um, but all of a sudden, as time goes, it's like a piece of clay, and we just start shaping. I mean, we kind of get to express ourselves, because, like, through music, like, we can, like, share our music pace. We kind of all just kind of come together with music. It's basically like the start of a career, I guess. Like, if we want to do this in the future, it's a start. It's kind of like a family now because we practice so much and we're always with each other all the time. As a teacher, I, I try to provide a safe place where they can be turned on to the beauty of music. And some of them, I think, it gives them an identity, kids that don't fit, and now they fit. So I'm pretty proud of that this year, especially. I gotta tell you something, we look at these kids, they seem committed and passionate. Is that the way you got them when they came in? Uh, some of them. I think, I think it's a gamut, it's, you know, they, they range from, some of them have never performed in their life before. Some of them, you know, are signed up at the local music store and they, mm -hmm. they have a little bit of experience, so it's, it's, not, it's not black and white, a little bit of both, I would say. Your passion for teaching, though. I mean, the music part, I'm starting to feel, mm -hmm. but the passion for teaching these kids, where does that come from? I, Is it, you said your parents, but it, that, that no, doesn't explain it all. No, no, that, I, you know, I never really saw myself being a teacher, but I think exposing kids, or like when I stumbled upon music and realized what it was and what it felt like, I think getting pe everyone to understand that that's possible for anybody. Mm. That's the passion. Like, it's not, it's, it's something you work at. It's not magic. It's something, it's a craft. And you, it could be yours. It's, it, yeah. it, whether it's a ho at the hobby level or if you're a professional, I mean, it's just the more time you put into it. But, but opening that door, possibility, for a 12-year-old, you know, and, and saying, you know, you can but this is what you have to do in order to get there. Yeah. That's, I think that's what I find the most uh, pleasure out of it. Let me ask you, uh, uh, benefit concert coming up? Yeah, it's a, it's a benefit concert. We started the class. Originally, it wasn't a benefit concert. We just were going to work towards the goal of performing. Uh, we had a tragedy the same year, actually, mm -hmm. where two of our students were struck by a van and both passed. They were both seventh graders. And who, Seventh grade. Yeah. Uh, I knew both of them. Both of them had music class, general music class, and uh, they were just getting, they were just, you know, bringing in posters of the Pink Floyd or the Beatles or, you know, they were just getting, the, the light was just coming on for them. Yeah. So it was, for me personally, it was, it was tough. One of the students I taught in elementary school as well, so I knew him for years. It was sad. And, you know, I still get kind of teared up thinking about it now. But and the concert is? But so the concerts for, it was originally, in, in for their benefits, you know, mm. for their, they had a couple of different charities for, right. in their name. And over the years, we continued to do it for that, but then uh, actually one of the students' mothers helps. She's a, part, she's a part of the team that puts on the show now. That's awesome. And she works in the school, yeah, she's great. Annie Preston. She, uh, so we, we were talking a few, like maybe five years ago, about tapping into the kids current because the current kids didn't no longer really connected to that right so now we we make it a process it's part it's partly them they we kind of talk about it and this is over like months we right. we don't just do it the first day we, we kind of let it happen and we try to find a connection that of some kind of benefit yeah. that the kids pick so you know whether it's for a student in a school or you know so, so somehow it's connected last year we did a playground for an elementary school all the money went towards that for kids with disabilities. To and make a difference. Yeah, it's a way for the kids to give back through music. You're doing important work, Jesse Ryan, music teacher, Dwight D. Eisenhower Middle School in Freehold, New Jersey, uh, part of our uh, collaboration with the New Jersey Education Association. Good stuff. By the way, check out not just our site, but the collaboration. Uh, check out the NJEA site to see this video again from Classroom Close-Up. And all the Classroom Close-Up features is a great series on NJTV, our sister station, our partners. Thank you.
Thank you. And on behalf of all those of, those of us with kids in schools, thank you for the work that you are doing every day and all the work of public school teachers. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are joined by Nick Ferroni, who is a history teacher, Union High School, and an activist. Good to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, real quick, we're going to go to a clip from our friends at the NJEA. This is a classroom close-up clip. Describe your activism. Uh, well, I'm, I'm an active educator, as most educators should be, and it's in reference to revising as far as what we teach in school, how we teach, and it's as far as being outspoken for students, particularly female students, minority students, and LGBTQ students. Well, let's find out more from this great uh, classroom close-up uh, profile of you and your work and the difference you make every day. Let's go to the clip. Okay, today for Throwback Thursday, we're gonna do a little feminist activity. Let's start off with a trick question. I want you guys as groups to come up with five things. Identify five things that a woman can't do better than a man or just a woman can't do. It could be professionally, it could be biologically. They bounced around every sort of idea because they really were thinking hard about it. A woman can do anything a man can. It's just not, a woman doesn't have that type of opportunity a man has. That's right. A woman can do anything a man can do. And that's what history teacher Nicholas Ferroni is trying to instill in his students. His lessons go way beyond the textbook. And there's a reason for that. I feel like our textbooks indirectly teach sexism, racism, and prejudice. Because we give the impression that white Christian males did everything. And that women, minorities, and certain religions were side notes. First question, up until 1978, Women could be fired from their job for being tall, divorced, pregnant, or married. Pregnant. Women were fired for being pregnant. The one that shocked me the most was where women will get fired if they, they are pregnant because they think that we can't do anything as good as we can because we are pregnant. When he asked about those five questions, I automatically thought that Women can do anything. There's nothing that women can't do. All right, so five things. Like, can women play football better than men? Can women be president better than men? Most of those things happened no more than 30 years ago, and my parents are only just slightly older than that. What a house! That, that surprised me the most. I thought it would be like more like 100 years ago, but it's no, not even a generation passed. Up until 1972, women were not allowed to run the Boston Marathon. All right. I thought the lesson today was crazy because women couldn't do something simple as opening up a credit card or a bank account. Women couldn't run a Boston Marathon. This is in the not too distant past. What women were. Mr. Ferroni's lessons in the classroom okay. so sparked an simple. interest in one of his students. She wanted to continue his discussions after school, so she created the Feminist Club. Being socially aware, advocating what you believe in is so important, especially as teens. So I created a feminist club to give people a chance to learn about social and world issues to come together and make a difference in society. Women have a lot more to offer than just who they wear or how they present themselves. We are people, we have thoughts, we have um, ambitions. Women are strong. Women have the ability to do anything we choose to, but we don't have the opportunity to do so. So I think women need to stand up and just go out there and do whatever they want to do. How do you guys feel about that? I mean, this is amazing stuff, Nick. I mean, the way you're able to engage these students, how great is that? It is. I mean, I love my job, and I always say all good teachers question their profession once a week because it is one of the most mentally draining jobs next to being a parent, I'm assuming. Yeah. But it's, I mean, I love what I do. It's, it's a great opportunity to kind of leave a big impression on kids and, and open their minds. It's fine, I do get some pushback for, for how I teach and what I teach uh, on a national level. Huh, why? Because again, I mean, it's, it's very interesting how, depending on where you go within this country, people believe that you know, teaching kids to be open-minded is their version of indoctrinating kids to accept people for who they are. When, when my argument is very simple, it shouldn't require bravery for a kid to be themselves. You know, our goals as educators are not only to educate, but to make sure kids enter class and feel safe and empowered. So these so-called, quote, social experiments um, that you engage in, describe one. Well, we did one recently that went viral. And obviously, we all know education experience is the best way to learn. Like, kids rarely appreciate something until they experience it. We, we all do. 
So uh, to give my students an idea of what it was like to be a woman in Congress, which is 20% women, obviously 80% men, the premise was we picked eight of our toughest football players, great kids, and we set up a scenario where it was 80% girls and 20% guys, and they were voting on issues that directly affected the boys. Wow. And the boys, the video is insane because they were flipping out how unfair this is and this outrageous, girls are deciding the fate of boys. And it was such a powerful lesson where at the end they finally got it. What about the guys deciding the fate of women all the time? Oh, did you see the picture? Well, it's, it's, that's the whole premise is, you know, I should have no right to tell a woman what to do with her body. Right. Just like I wouldn't ask women's advice on a jock strap when I'm going to the sporting well, thanks for yeah. bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, and how, how, how into this are most of your students? They are because I, I force them to be engaged or I put them in situations where they feel like it's, we really care about things until it affects us personally. Mm. So we just shot one recently to show them what Jim Crow South was like. We didn't base it on race, we based it on grade. And I had my students vote on new school policies that were affecting freshmen and sophomores and giving them the benefits and not juniors and seniors. Wow. And all my students are juniors and seniors. So they were flipping out. And then at the end, it obviously allows us to tie in right to what we're doing in class. Nick, when did you know that teaching would be your professional life? I would say when the first time I saw Indiana Jones, I'm like, I want to be that guy. But I, it's, well, I can make that connection. Well, in, I mean, Indiana Jones just made me fascinated with history, uh, adventure, education. That we, what we think we know is, is pretty much, we know facts, we don't know the truth. There's facts and there's truth. There's three sides to every story. So it's so interesting. You grew up, and I grew up in a hardcore, we did not grow up at exactly the same time, yeah. but I grew up in a hardcore, male-dominated, ethnic urban, otherwise known as an all-Italian neighborhood. Let's just say it was quite traditional, meaning women were not dominant and strong. They were, but they yeah. weren't allowed to be who they were. What was it like for you? It was the same. I mean, my dad's very, very, very proud Italian man. I always say my dad showed me what a man does. My mom taught me how to be a man. There it but, is. but it's it's at an early age, and I always bring up I always bring up John Adams's quote about women, where uh, Abigail Adams was basically writing, "Don't forget about the women." And he joked around. He said, "Abigail, we all know that men govern, but women rule." That's right. And I'm thinking about my my mom ruled the household. I love my dad, but he wouldn't get to work unless my mom found his keys every morning. <laughs> so it's it's that premise. So it's like from yeah. from a practical standpoint. Women do rule. I mean, yeah. it's in most households, yet on a govern level, they're, they have very little involvement. You love what you do. I do, and it, it keeps me passionate. I'm still no, no gray hairs yet. If, if I do get them, it's my students' fault. Yeah. I say that, but it's every day I still love what I do, and it allows me to be creative, and it, it gives me an opportunity. It's like having 150 little brothers and sisters. But there are so many amazing teachers in New Jersey at my school and throughout, so it's my goal is just to kind of show that there are so many teachers going above and beyond for their students every day, and they don't get enough recognition. Nick Ferroni is a history teacher at Union High School and also clearly an activist. And um, on behalf of all of us who have children in the public schools, I want to say thank you to you and all your colleagues for what you do every day. Thank, thank you. you very much. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. It is our honor and pleasure to introduce the 2016-2017 New Jersey State Teacher of the Year at the uh, NJEA convention here in Atlantic City. She is Arjean Safari. First, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. What was it like when you were told that you were, in fact, the Teacher of the Year? Oh, it was all sorts of emotions. I was super excited. Um, I couldn't believe it. I felt truly honored and blessed um, and also a little scared <laughs> of the amount of responsibility that this brings. Arjean came to the United States with her husband in 1994, immigrated to the United, United States from Moscow. Describe coming to this country in, in 1994. Um, first of all, you had been in love with music since you were six years old. Yes, I studied music since I was six, professionally, actually. Um, and when, when I came to this country with my husband and my newborn daughter, um, it was a pretty scary experience because I was a refugee and I was really hoping to find freedom and, you know, all the dreams of becoming uh, an American and taking advantage of all the opportunities that are here. Um, and we really didn't have anything. There was really no money, no connections. So 
it was a challenge. It was a big challenge. But um, I think it's all those hard times that I had to go through that make this journey even more appealing and special to me. You told me before we got on the air that you love music as far back as you can remember. But your love of teaching. My love of teaching came later. I uh, always thought I was going to be a performer. I didn't think I would be a teacher. Um, so when I came to this country, I was trying to find myself looking to do different things. I went to school to study language, ended up getting a, another degree in finance and business. And while I was at school, I had different gigs and jobs as a musician. And I realized how much I loved doing it. And after graduating from college, I actually started to work in business. Um, actually, was on Wall Street for a little bit. And meanwhile, I was doing these different things and directing musicals. And when I finally did um, a direct musical with a high school level, I fell in love with the experience of just working with these kids and making them feel special about themselves. And that gradually transformed um, me into wanting to do music, teaching. But I think the final moment was when I um, met this young girl in eighth grade and she lost her father to 9-11, but she wanted to be a professional musician. And I decided to help her to get into this top performing school in New York City. And I was working with her um, to prepare her for this experience. It's a non-tuition free school if you get in. And she got into the school and I can't tell you how I felt when she got into the school. It was nothing compared to any of the performing experiences I had. So I think that's when I knew and I decided to just become a teacher after that, and I never looked back. It's um, got to be very rewarding for you. Absolutely. Uh, there is no way I can describe the feeling when you get those Try. kids to... Well, I just... When they come to you and they say that, you know, you changed my life, you transformed me, I want to do what you do, I never thought I would be uh, looking at the music or listening to the music the same way. This, that makes... That, that's it. That's why we are in this profession. That's why we do what we do. And the passion that I transform to my students, I transfer my love for music. I cannot imagine doing anything more rewarding. It, you can't. It, it, you can. So, it, so you could perform uh, at Carnegie Hall. You could perform at the most extraordinary venue with your beautiful music because you are so talented. Or you could transform the life of a young person and have them say, I've been turned on to music in a way I never could have imagined. I want to pursue um, a career in music. And you would choose the latter? Absolutely, because you are changing someone else's life, because you are leaving a legacy, because these are the people who will come and tell you that you had an influence in their lives. Yeah. And I don't know how to ex explain, explain this, but yes, the performing experiences are great. You, you reach out to the audiences. You make them feel different. You make them think about something differently. But when you actually reach to the soul and heart of the student, and you make them feel better about themselves, you make them realize their passions, their talents that they never even knew they had, don't you think that's the best transformative experience one Nothing can better. have? Nothing better. So let me ask you. You came to this country uh, 22, 23 years ago, right? Did you envision or was it on your list of accomplishments? I want to become the New Jersey State teacher. You're laughing already. Teacher of the year. Did you <laughs> say that's, that's what I want to be? No, absolutely not. Um, what I knew that I wanted to be is someone who will make a difference. I knew that. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to do something for the community and for this country. Because anyone who comes to this country and takes advantage of those opportunities is blessed to have this incredible country and to be able to really you know, explore those opportunities. I, I never had an opportunity would, like this. Sorry for interrupting. Would you have not had, I don't want to be overly philosophical or political, but when you were in Moscow, or you, if you were there today, you don't know because you're here in the United States doing great things, would you have been able to make the difference that you are making today here, back there? I would love to think so. Um, however, 
uh, it was a different climate. Um, it was very different to even feel that you can do what you want to do. Here, it's a land of opportunities. I don't think uh, we realize that. People who are born in this country yeah, take it for granted. No, you don't. I don't take it for granted. I don't take a single day for granted. And that's how I approach my teaching, too. I don't walk into the classroom and say, oh, here, another teaching day. I actually take every day to use that as an opportunity to do something special. As the uh, Teacher of the Year in the state, as someone who's made a difference in the lives of many, A, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us who have thank children you. in public schools, um, all of us who have children, thank you. all of us who love music. But the other thing I'm going to ask you is this. What's the number one lesson you've learned about being a leader? The best thing about being a leader is being able to inspire people. If you're able to inspire other people, that, that is the best leadership one can ever imagine. It's not a position. It's not a job. It's an ability to influence other people and to make them better and to inspire and to lead them in the best way that you can and to make them believe in themselves more than they can possibly imagine. Congratulations. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Steve. Thank Appreciate you. it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Montclair State University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Verizon, and by the North Ward Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. My husband and I spent more than 30 years in the public schools. We're retired, but we like to stay involved. Do you think he's going to learn to fly? We're just as busy now as in our teaching days. The same goes for a lot of the retired educators we know. Let me see you all flap your wings like your penguins learning to fly. Teaching is all about building relationships, and that never goes away. Because once a teacher, always a teacher. We're Ed and Miriam, and we are proud to be New Jersey educators.